Hey guys, I've had a really busy day today, but I thought just before chilling out for this evening, I would put a video together that I've been meaning to put in place for absolutely ages. It's about something which many people, especially Christians, totally fail to look at, and yet it is absolutely crucial to everybody's existence. Uh, even though people maybe don't realize it, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is one of the uh, building blocks of the whole universe. It's actually that from which all things were created and for which everything exists. So we kind of need to get our heads around it. Now, there'll be many people listening to this video who, who don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity uh, or maybe who don't know what to think. Uh, if, if you're somebody who's like really antagonistic towards the doctrine of the Trinity, I would love to chat with you. Feel free to give me a call or get in contact. The reality is that I can't go through the full breadth of the scriptural teaching uh, on that at the moment. Uh, but but bear in mind that this is just a short video. So if you've got like got objections, you're thinking, well, what about this? What about that? Uh, get in contact I'd love to talk about that and to and to see what what you're thinking and why you think it's not the case uh, the Trinity is actually uh, something that Christians have believed in uh, ever since Jesus Christ came and the Spirit was poured out and in fact the Old Testament before that uh, points towards God's triune nature as well uh, part, part of the reason I wanted to do this video was uh, because people often use illustrations that just uh, that are derived from created things to try to explain the creator and they fall woefully short so I thought it'd be helpful to put this video together and explain why God is not like an egg okay he's not not like an egg I'm going to tell you three uh, points three propositions which help to uh, understand and grasp what the Bible teaches about God's triune nature, God as Trinity. But before I do that, I just want to read something out that I think is really helpful. Uh, it's by a guy called uh, John Brown of Haddington. He was a Scottish Bible teacher, professor and divine. And he, he said something that I thought was really kind of telling when it comes to how we try to articulate uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, he said this, as God himself hath nowhere exemplified any explication of this mystery of the subsistence of three persons in one Godhead by any similitude drawn from natural things. That being, God's not tried to describe himself using nature to, to, uh, to explain his triune uh, nature, his, his personhood, which is plural, and yet his, his oneness as there only being one God. He's, he's never tried to do that by referring to nature. And so John Brown of Haddington says, since God's never done this, it must in itself be very daring and very hurtful and darkening to the truth for any man to attempt it. That's great, isn't it? He looks at all of our efforts at maybe using eggs or, uh, or some people would refer to uh, a man and say well a man is both a husband and, and an employee and a father or people looking at ice and saying well that articulates the doctrine of trinity or people pointing to apples and saying this is what the doctrine of trinity is like and he says that that's very daring and it's very hurtful and very darkening to the truth to do those things so i'm not going to do that today but what i'm going to do is give you three different uh, statements that will help you to understand the breadth of what the bible teaches about uh, God's triune nature, who he is. The reality is that all the illustrations that we put in place fall short because they don't take into account the full breadth of what the Bible says. And in fact, there's a guy called Hilary of Poitiers, who's bishop in Poitiers in, in France, and he was in the fourth century. And in, in his work called On the Trinity, he said this, since the work that is creation transcends our thoughts, all thought must be transcended by the maker. Since the work transcends our thoughts, all that is created actually is, is beyond what we can fully manage to grasp, even though we may claim to have a mastery of all things, we haven't got that at all. All thought must be transcended by the maker. God is above these thoughts, but he has made himself known. And that's what I want us to look at because God in his word in the Bible, which is inspired by him, and it's all his word has made himself known very clearly. We have concrete revelation about his nature, which is which is brilliant. So uh, basically, there's three points. First number point, there is only one God. There is only one God. Second point, God is three 
persons. And third point, each person is equally and fully God. If you grasp those three points, you're doing fairly well in grasping something of what the Bible teaches about God's triune nature. You see, people sometimes use an egg and they go, well, an egg, that's that's what God's like. And what they'll do is they'll say, well, OK, uh, we've got the shell. And then you know, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to break it, aren't I? Which which firstly is the, the big issue because you can't break God, can you? Uh, but anyway, uh, it's only if God becomes a man and allows himself to be broken that he can be broken. Uh, you can't break the creator, but I'm just going to pop it open and let's have a look inside. And we've got the yolk and the white there. You knew, I knew this was going to be a technical description. Uh, so we have three parts. And so what some people do is they go, look, there's something that illustrates what God's like. They, they, people do the same with an apple core, don't they? You've got like the skin on the outside and then the apple bit and then the core on the inside. I don't know what the apple bit's called. The flesh. Uh, the point here is, though, that we do have one egg. But if you take away the yolk and take away the white, you don't have an egg. You just have an eggshell. That, that's all you've got. But that actually is not what the Bible teaches about God. Because as I said, there's, there's one God and God is three persons. E and each person is equally and fully God. So that means that if we say that each person is equally and fully God, this eggshell does not do very well at representing each person doing being equally and fully God because the eggshell is on its own without those other bits, not fully egg. Yeah, it's, it's just a bit of the egg. Whereas the doctrine of the Trinity teaches something quite different, actually. People sometimes use this illustration. Uh, they could use me as an example. You know, on the one hand, uh, I am a husband. They'll say, oh, well, Andy's... And he's one man, but look, he can be both a husband, uh, he can also be uh, a father, and he can also be a church leader. And he can operate in these different roles. Uh, well, well th the issue with that is that that, that, that actually denies uh, the plurality of persons within God. I'm still only one person, and yet the Bible clearly displays that God is one being, but he is also three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in fact, what I've just articulated there, and referring to myself as one man, but then with these three roles, or in a sense three modes, is called modalism. And this was a heresy that the early church turned down. What, what we're looking at here, when we're looking at an egg, that's another heresy, if we try to refer that to God, nothing wrong with eggs, but if we try to use that to illustrate God, that's another heresy. Called, which can be known as partialism, where it's just a, a bit of the egg is God. It's like saying that God the Father is a bit of God, or Jesus is a bit of God, but he's not fully God. And that actually falls well short of what the Bible teaches. So I want us to just quickly, quickly look through this and bang through these points. There's only one God. God is three persons. Each person is equally and fully God. And think through what the Bible actually says. So Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That, that's a straight declaration that the Jews proclaim. Jesus confirmed it in Mark 12, 29 as well. There's only one God and the Lord is one. He's not split. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. This is Isaiah 43, verse 10. This is when he, God's facing off against other things that we would claim to be God, but he identifies them as false gods. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. There's no other God, God thinks. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Do, do you see this? Like God's excluding the possibility of there being any other gods. So the doctrine of the Trinity is not that there are three gods or three godly beings, but that there is only one true and living God. That's the first fact that we need to grasp hold of. Point two. God is three persons. God is three persons. When we say person, that's a term which we've, that Christians use to try to articulate something of what the Bible actually teaches about God's nature. We don't mean persons with like hands and feet, not like that, although Jesus Christ had hands and feet. But we mean persons when we refer to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
To say that the father is a person or the son is a person is to, is to acknowledge that they are not its, that they are them. Like to say that they are persons is to rec recognize that the Bible actually ascribes agency and role to them. So the father sends, the father loves, the father is well pleased. Like the son in his incarnation submits, he humbles himself, he rejoices, like he saves. The spirit testifies, the spirit grieves, the spirit convicts. This is the individual agency of the persons of God. Th these are separate roles which each one assumes. It's not that there's division within God, but there is distinction within him. So we don't confuse the persons. We, we don't say uh, the father is the son or the son is the father or the spirit is the father. The, equally, the father didn't die on the cross. The son didn't send the father. There's this distinction that the Bible seems to make. And you see Jesus actually making it as well. And, and I think we see this most clearly on a couple of occasions, this distinction in personhood within God that would stop us being modalists especially. You know when Jesus gives the Great Commission and he talks about baptising people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, what we see is each person of the triune God represented there. Equally, at the baptism of Jesus, and this is probably the clearest time we see it, what we see is this, and it says in Matthew 10, and when Jesus, Matthew, sorry, chapter 6, when Jesus was baptised, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So we've got Jesus there, the Son. We've got the Spirit descending like a dove, God the Spirit. And then we've got God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, whom I love. This is the three persons of God on display at that point. Can you see why that articulation of the Trinity or illustration which I offered before of me as a father and as a husband and as a church leader is totally flawed? Because they're really just modes in which I express myself. Whereas at the, inc at the incarnation and the baptism of Christ, what we see actually is each person being re represented and on display there. Uh, to say as well that God is three persons is not to say that he's three parts. Hopefully I've given you that impression. It's not to be like this. It's not to say that God is tripartite. That, that, that's not, that's a different doctrine to do something else. Like if we talk about uh, God being three persons, uh, actually what we need to reckon with then is to what degree are those persons God? And the third point that I'm saying is that each person is fully God. There's only one God. God is three persons and each person is equally and fully God. So that means the father is fully God. He, he's not lacking anything. When the son became flesh, it wasn't like the father was then missing out on something. He wasn't fully God. In the same way, the son is fully, fully God. And this is probably the one that, that has, uh, there's, about which there's been the most uh, controversy and battles. Who Jesus is is constantly attacked. But Jesus is the eternal God who always was. Specifically, the Bible refers to him as the word. And, it, and, and that's who he was from eternity. And the word became flesh and we know him now as Jesus but God the Son the Word is eternal the way that the Bible refers to him actually in various different ways loads of different authors Bible authors lots of different apostles referring to him in different ways Paul calls him our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ Thomas called him my Lord and my God Peter calls him our God and Saviour Jesus Christ like Jesus himself identified himself as the God of the Israelites do you remember in John 8 58 when he says before Abraham was I am do you see how over and over again actually Jesus is saying I'm I'm God I, I'm God and he's not just claiming to be part of God he is claiming to be God and just just before we carry on 
at this point, some people, they've got this crazy idea that at some point Constantine came along and he said, oh, well, actually, we need to make Jesus God. Yeah, let's make Jesus God. Let's come up with a Trinity thing. That's a good idea. Uh, but nobody really thought Jesus was God till like, you know, the third or fourth century. That kind of rubbish that people talk about. I want to read something out to you from a guy called Ignatius, which I think is brilliant. You can put this in your pipe and smoke it. Uh, this is what it says. Uh, when Ignatius says, uh, United and elect, this is referring to himself, through genuine suffering by the will of God and of Jesus, uh, will of the Father and of Jesus Christ, our God. The will of the Father and of Jesus Christ, our God. Do you know when Ignatius said that? They think Ignatius died around 108 AD. So he was alive in, in, the, in the lifetime when some of the apostles were still alive. He still would have been around, banging around, talking to people, hearing from people. This was an early Christian belief in who Jesus was. Like, so when we see in the Bible that it says that Jesus was God, it, it wasn't that people have twisted it and developed stuff over time. Even right then, back in the first century, we saw people confirming this. In fact, he goes on uh, and he talks about once you took on new life through the blood of God. That's great, isn't it? Through the blood of God. This is this is Jesus they're talking about. The Bible's so clear about Jesus being God, fully God. Uh, and also early Christians believed it as well. So here's the point. Jesus isn't just like a chip off the old block when we say he's the son of God. The Jews understood that that claim to be the son of God was actually a claim to be the God of the universe, the creator God of all things, the one who sustains all things, which Jesus Christ does, the one who is the God of the Israelites. That, that was the claim that Jesus was making when he claimed to be the son of God. So we need to get this. Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is fully God as well. The Holy Spirit is fully God. Again, this is something that's been under attack, but, but his name is included alongside the names of other persons of the Trinity, which I mentioned before at the Great Commission, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus teaches people to baptize in that name. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 5, actually to lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God himself. Perhaps... Probably the clearest articulation or expression of Jesus's deity, uh, sorry, the Holy Spirit's deity, the fact that the Holy Spirit is himself God, is when Jesus promises to send him in John 14 to, to chapter 16. If, if you look in there, it's clear that when Jesus promises a helper or a, a paraclete, someone who will be an advocate or comforter or helper, different ways it gets translated, when he promises this one, it's clear that he doesn't think that in sending the helper, the disciples are getting a downgrade. He doesn't think that at all. And not only that, Jesus ascribes to the Holy Spirit masculine pronouns. He speaks of the Holy Spirit as a person. This is why we refuse to accept this idea that the Holy Spirit is just an active force. It's kind of like on Star Wars where you just channel this thing. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. The Holy Spirit is personal. This is why elsewhere, I think in Ephesians, Paul talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Do you, do you see that? Over and over again, the Bible's laying out that each person, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is fully God. Not just a part of God, but fully God himself. Now, why, why is this important? Well, on the one hand, if we just go off what I've just spoken about with, with, the, tr with the, the deity of the Holy Spirit, that means that the Holy Spirit who now dwells in Christians is actually God dwelling within us. It's not like a little bit of God. It's certainly the Holy Spirit certainly is a down payment, a deposit, a foretaste of what we will one day know. But also he is himself God. We truly are the temple of the Holy Spirit if we're Christians. Equally, though, what we've talked about here, that there's one God, that God is three persons and each person is equally and fully God, means that God is himself a loving community. That there wasn't ever a time when God was lacking anything. God has always delighted in himself. The son was given glory and shared glory with the father since before the world began. Like There was never a time when God was lonely. You need to get this because actually the beautiful thing about getting the doctrine of the Trinity is that then you start to find out, wow, I've been included in this. God has rescued me. He's included me in his loving community. And so straight away, it starts to make loads more sense of when, of when you're reading the Bible and you get to like Ephesians chapter one. 
And you go, verse 3, like, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, why? Why? Well, because he's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Suddenly we've got God the Father working through salvation through God the Son. And then later on, verse 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit sealing people. This is how salvation happens, guys. If you're somebody who loves Jesus, if you're somebody who's a Christian and belongs to him, don't just do away with the doctrine of the Trinity as some technical thing that we can't just get our heads around. This is something which is to be delighted in and it's fundamental to understand actually what the Bible says about who God is and how you've been rescued as well. So I wanted to just get into that a little bit. Feel free if I've not been clear on anything, if you've got any questions on anything, uh, I'd love to I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Like we as a church are working hard to make Jesus known in this city. We're tired of half watered down truths uh, of pictures of Jesus uh, being spread around which don't represent him clearly. We we're, we're tired of that. We we don't want any more of that. So many Christians actually end up getting confused and discouraged and he even get dragged away into different cults and different religions because actually they don't really know who the God is who they believe in so I, I wanted I wanted to share that with you and uh, please do respond